you know, every day I felt my, my moods were different. My hormones were just out of control, <laughs> right? So we're talking about young people who were just dealing with a lot in the best circumstance. And I, I often ask people like, what were you dealing with when you were 16 or 17 years old? Okay, now take away the English language, take away your legal status, your parents, you're not in school, and you're just doing everything out of order and in a very disorienting way, right? So that sort of um, emotional and material sort of confusion. Um, and, that, and then I mentioned, you know, over time, but also just by learning and observing the society and the system young people are embedded in, they can become oriented. And it's often through relationships with each other and um, with longer settled unaccompanied young people that they achieve this process of orientation. Identify your general why. Why do you want that? Because you want to be more loving. You want to just be more giving, more uplifting. Why knowledge matters. Welcome. I'm Yannick, your host, and now joining me, Stephanie L. Gonzalez. Professor Stephanie L. Gonzalez is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and now here to discuss her newly published book, Sin Padres Ni Papalas. Welcome, Professor Gonzalez, to the show. I'm so delighted to have you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, first and foremost, I just want to uh, get a little bit the sense of who you are. And I think also our listeners want uh, to know uh, who you are. So let's start off what you are usually doing the very first thing in the morning when you get up. <laughs> the first thing I do in the morning. <laughs> First, I check to see where my cat is to make sure I don't suddenly get up and then make him wake up um, in a startle. But usually when I get up in the morning, it's uh, coffee time. I am definitely one of those people that just immediately checks my email to see what fire went off while I was sleeping uh, and kind of set the tone for my day. Uh, I like to write every morning for two, two and a half hours and just get the rest of the day going. Wonderful. Now, let's dive into the book. You just released your newly published book by Berkeley University Press. Mm -hmm. And talk about how this book came into being. When really this conception of this idea of Sin Padres Ni Papales came into your mind. And then ultimately you started writing your very first sentence. Yeah, the book started as a dissertation project. Um, I was a graduate student starting in 2011 at the University of Southern California. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. I went to college at UCLA. I studied political science there and was sort of coming to know a little bit of the sociology or the social science really around immigrant community formation. I'm the daughter of Salvadoran immigrants who arrived as young people to Los Angeles. I didn't really grow up knowing much about how immigrant communities form, why Salvadorans were in LA, why, why LA and why in such high numbers. Um, so I came to, to study the social science essentially of uh, immigrant community life. And I was really drawn to understanding how immigrant youth, whether they be migrant young people themselves or children of immigrants, uh, come to form their identities. It was sort of that question I was grappling with, right, as the daughter of immigrants. And I started to study undocumented student groups, immigrant student groups. I was heavily involved with the immigrant student movement uh, at the time and came to be incredibly involved around organizing around the DREAM Act, 
organizing around deferred action for childhood arrivals uh, in 2012 and on. So when I was in graduate school, I wanted to know how these community groups and how collectives and organizing really shape young people's identity formation. I was told that there was a, a group of undocumented Central Americans that met at a coffee shop at such and such intersection in Los Angeles. I went to that group and it turns out they were unaccompanied, undocumented garment workers, all of them across the board, young people who grew up as young as 9, 10, 11 years old as child laborers in Los Angeles. And they were doing that work to survive themselves, right? Pay their own rent, pay their own food, the clothes on their back, but also to send money to help the families that they left behind in Guatemala. It was a completely different side of the coin of studying immigrant youth group identity formation, immigrant youth life in Los Angeles. And it uh, really rocked my world, right? The fact that there were garment factories in LA, right? Like you think garment factories, garment labor exploitation is an over there problem, right? We see the labels on our clothes, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and we think like, oh, that's over there. Uh, but it was in central Los Angeles, right? Where I grew up. Uh, children in those industries really, again, rocked my world and that they were undocumented young people, not protected by school teachers, peers, the sort of goal of college and the future, and then sort of uh, under this umbrella of deserving legal protection, but there were kids that were just outside of every sort of institution of protection that we imagine. No parents, no legal status, no school, uh, and just managing life on their own. So I really felt as someone from LA, you know, as the daughter of Central American immigrants, uh, as a sociologist, as someone who's just uh, very interested in storytelling for the sake of um, generational movement towards progress, I was compelled to write this book. And and I'm an academic. I'll be lying if I say, like, writing is what we do. <laughs> it's the currency of our economy. So I had to write it also. But it was really a sort of a culmination of what I feel like was the 30 plus years of my life before this book. Yeah, it's beautiful. You also wrote it in a way that is in so many ways empowering, at least from my perspective. And I also have to say that I was pretty oblivious of uh, these issues to some extent because it, it's just not my reality. But really diving into the book and what these young people actually go through is tremendous. But also the human capital that they actually bring to the U.S., and I started, you know, relatively, uh, you know, recently really studying more and more closely the United States and really its history. And it's really repeating itself. And um, it's tremendous. Just these metas, you are talking about these metas that these young people have in really in order mm -hmm. for them to improve not just their life, but first and foremost, their families back home right so just give us a little bit of context of why there are so many millions of people who cross the want to cross the border who literally risk their lives and especially in your case i mean they don't have basically they're undocumented and without any parents so they don't have any protection and they are really the risk of being in one way or another trafficked it's really, really likely. So give us a little bit the context on, on why these people come in the first place so that our viewers have somehow a context of uh, which we can really uh, build this conversation. Yeah, I appreciate that you're using all the Spanish language terms that I put into the book. Uh, sin padre, sin papeles, right, uh, is... Um, without parents nor papers. In chapter one of the book, I really explore this idea of the reasons why children migrate. And I frame the conversation around this idea of metas, right? The goals that young people have. Uh, what I lay out in the beginning of the, of the chapter is that children are not migrating sort of out of thin air and without having some kind of historical, social, and political context, an economic context of their migration. Children migrating from Central America and Mexico are following 
what is decades long trends of migration from Mexico, uh, originally men, young men who were migrating to work, then women, then families, and then children, Central America in the 70s, I mean, as far back as the 50s, actually, um, the disruption caused by U.S. intervention in the region, economic integration policies, the destabilization of governments, democratic governments that um, really destabilized the entire social fabric, uh, targeting for decades young people who were not just threats uh, against government repression in the present, in their organizing uh, against government repression, but also seen as future threats, right? The, that they would be growing into um, political activism as they came of age. Young people have always been targets of um, political repression because of that, right? The sort of looming uh, organizing threat that they might present. So the Central American young people that I present in the book, I interviewed 75 people, but I spent six years in community with young people across Los Angeles. Uh, so hundreds of unaccompanied, undocumented young people that I met. And what they all talked about is that within, from, you know, this backdrop, within this context of decades of migration, of movement, displacement, decades of um this investment in educational institutions, privatization of economic resources, destabilization of economies, uh, all of that, right? They talk about being young people who cannot see a future as family members, as siblings, as potential future partners, not being able to see futures as adults, generally speaking, and not being able to see a future within their family and community. So migration becomes, in some cases, a safety valve, right? Like a way to get out and move that future forward to achieve a meta or a goal of starting a business, of building a house, of saving enough money to come back and finish school, or maybe going to school in the U.S. and coming back and starting a career. One of the things I try to make clear in the book is that young people don't migrate with the intention of staying forever in their destination. A lot of times young people thought that they'd migrate for three, five, six years, and then go home to their origin countries and still be teenagers, or at least young enough where they would see their parents again. So towards the end of the book, I talk about what it means to now be in your 20s and 30s and to not have seen your mom or to have parents who uh, passed during that time. But the the sort of meta is always um, this imagined future as, yes, migrants, as people that sort of occupy um, a social role in a society, but also as adolescents who are imagining a future of adulthood, which includes independence and autonomy and self-sufficiency in their origin countries. In this framing of metas, I also talk about collective goals, collective metas, which is young people thinking about, again, their siblings, their parents, their communities. And one of the quotes that, oh, you know, sticks with me and I think about it constantly is one person that said, yo vine con una meta aquí. I came here with one goal, para que mi mamá no sufra, so that my mom doesn't suffer or so that my mom suffers less. So he, this young person that I interviewed was willing to put his life on the line in migration his future on the line, not knowing what awaited him in the U.S. with this goal, with this meta of his mom suffering less, right? So it isn't just young people selfishly migrating so that they can achieve something, right, or take something from a society, but it is really with this sort of collective orientation to less suffering and an imagined future. Yeah, and um, what's also very clear that there is obviously like a, to some extent, as you also mentioned, desperation, right? So it's just so important because when you can't mm -hmm. really Im imagine like a future in your country and really to overcome the barriers that you have to face, it is, uh, it's really obviously um, the right thing potentially to do and take the risk, but it's huge. And so 
please tell us a little bit about the big challenges that young people, especially undocumented, without any parents really face when they go through the journey and then when they actually arrive in the U.S. Because that's also very interesting when you talked about this because I was also ob obvious about these kind of facts because you always think about, well, there all there are already communities there, you know, they will... Uh, you know, help them and it will be beautiful, but it is not. So tremendous. So tell us about the obstacle that these uh, young people face. Yeah, I talk in the book about this idea of disorientation. And again, I borrow language from the young people that I spoke to during my six years of re research. This idea of disorientation, disorientation upon arrival. Um, I don't spend too much time in the sort of migration journey phase, though I do mention uh, young people talking about, you know, points along the journey where they questioned, did I make the right decision? Should I go back? Uh, what if I don't make it? But again, there was one interview participant, I remember interviewing him in a Starbucks, um, I don't know what you even call them, lobby restaurant, <laughs> uh, in a Starbucks. Uh, he told me, you know, the option was either I keep going and I risk dying along the way or I go back and I just die in a forged country, right? Um, and sometimes it wasn't always physical death that was the threat, but what social scientists refer to as social death, right? This not being able to imagine or achieve a future, not being able to participate in a society productively, effectively, um, as a whole person is the equivalent of social death. Um, so when people arrive in the U.S. context, I, I focus on the Los Angeles case because that's where I did my research. I talk about how young people um, express this feeling of disorientation. And it is disorientation both like emotionally, socially, culturally, right, that culture shock. But it's also disorientation to the system, the structure, the sort of uh, functioning of the society. Young people felt disoriented by, um, you know, how do you find a place to live? How do you find a job? How do you take the bus to get across town? Um, the disorientation of money, right? Like having to, to save money, how to spend money. Why is money always missing or like slipping through my fingers? Um, and then the one thing you mentioned is you assume that young people will be received by the generations of immigrants that have gone before them, right? These very dense immigrant neighborhoods or enclaves um, that have settled, especially in cities like Los Angeles, right? But thinking also Chicago, New York, San Francisco, all across the U.S., dense immigrant receiving cities and states. And what I find is that there have been policies in the U.S. that have chipped away at immigrants and immigrant communities' ability to achieve stability in the U.S. and to achieve mobility over the longer term. Central American and Mexican youth are arriving to the U.S. to neighborhoods, to families, to households that have been plagued by their own illegality, that the U.S. refuses to provide opportunities for legalization for long-settled adults, right? 60-some um, percent of undocumented immigrants in the U.S. have been in the U.S. for over 10 or 15 years. Um, so we have long-settled individuals who have been exploited for their labor, who've been underpaid, wage theft is rampant, people who've been living in dilapidated housing, multifamily um apartments that hold multiple families, right? Uh, people who are just resource impoverished um, in the very essential sense of being able to provide housing, food, and just stability and well-being in everyday life. This is not to say that networks are not, um, or immigrant households or families are not rich in care and affection and all of those things, right? But what I try to explain in the book is that any well-meaning individual, any altruistic, long-settled aunt, uncle, brother, or cousin may be so resource-constrained by their own undocumented status or by their own 
um, labor exploitation and their underpayment that a young person arrives at their door and they're unable to take that person in. A child that is 11, 12, 13 years old being turned away because the long settled adult says, I just can't afford to have you in this house. So um, it becomes this emotional disorientation. And again, I, I try to remind the reader that we are just talking about immigrants who are new to a society and people who are sort of dislocated in the geographic sense, right? Like from one country to another. I'm talking about young people who are also coming into their bodies, adolescents who are figuring out themselves, right? Their bodies are changing, their moods are changing. Um, I recently wrote something very explicitly about how young people say like, you know, every day I felt my, my moods were different. My hormones were just out of control, right? So we're talking about young people who are just dealing with a lot in the best circumstance, right? I often ask people like, what were you dealing with when you were 16 or 17 years old? Okay, now take away the English language, take away your legal status, your parents, you're not in school, and you're just doing everything out of order and in a very disorienting way, right? So that sort of um, emotional and material sort of confusion. Um, and, that, and then I mentioned, you know, over time, but also just by learning and observing the society and the system young people are embedded in, they can become oriented. And it's often through relationships with each other and um, with longer settled, unaccompanied young people that they achieve this process of orientation. What's also really interesting what you're mentioning is, I mean, we already know that there's a lot of confusion for, you know, kids who grow up, whether in the States or other Western societies, just in general, because things are changing so fast. Today, it's like, you know, a attention span of 20 seconds. You can barely, you know, you can't really dissect it. You can't really understand what you're actually, you know, reading. And so there is so much complexity there already for a kid who doesn't go to such a journey. And nonetheless, what I see, and that is really, that's really something, because that's, again, that's why I, I said at the very beginning, that's incredible when you have ultimately labor, people who come into the country who have a show, this kind of resilience, who actually make it even though unfortunately still a lot they you know in terms of material poverty they more or less they they can't really overcome it necessarily but you know it, it remains to be seen of course but then to see that these or most at least that you have interviewed have actually done a pretty successful journey given the circumstances that they were in so what do you think is the reason that they are able to demonstrate such resiliency. Yeah, I I can think of of several things, and you know my my thinking around this topic has changed even since I submitted those final files and they hit print on the book. Right, um, I can, as an outsider, attribute the resilience to the original goal which again isn't just based on individual desires or individual outcomes they are rooted in collective orientations and they are rooted in the sort of um, role and responsibility young people identify for themselves and within their families to provide care right um, I do think in some cases when we make maybe this is just the way I think about my myself and uh, my sort of positioning in mm -hmm. academia is when I set a goal for myself, if I don't achieve that goal, I'm the only one that really knows, right? <laughs> if, if I change my mind and I, or I switch the goal, like it, it kind of just falls on me. But I think that there is a sort of collective orientation to young people's goal setting, which actually isn't a feature of childhood in a neoliberal individualistic western society right children are actually taught to think about themselves and to receive resources and capital and 
to think about how they're going to advance their futures. So the idea that we're talking about family systems of care and that young people, again, as young as I've had a, a participant in my research, I met him when he was 19, but he had been working as a shoe shiner in Guatemala at the age of three, right? He already had this sort of sense of collective orientation. So I think that is the sort of uh, one of the drivers of resilience um, is that collective orientation. I think also the um, the I, now I'm now that I'm saying it out loud, it actually again my thinking is constantly <laughs> changing. I wonder if the same thing is actually happening in the U.S. That there's sort of a, a collective community orientation towards the young people that they're meeting in the U.S. context. There's something about unaccompanied young people um, who are maybe recently arrived or newer to the journey of orientation and adaptation or life in the U.S. that um, they see longer settled young people and they respect and admire their resilience, right? The, the, their achievement, how far along the journey those young people are and to be able to then reflect back on themselves where these are some of the most intelligent people I've met in my life where they would say things like when I when I met so and so uh, someone else in the group um, I realized I'm not the problem because that person is really smart that person is very responsible that person really loves their family and they're suffering just as much as I am so the the sort of failure that they felt they were experiencing in the poverty or in the isolation young people very quickly realized Oh, it's actually not a me thing. It's a structural thing. There's something about the way society is organized here that is causing me to suffer in this way. And being able to sort of reflect that back to one another through their relationship was so important to their ability to move from orientation, I, I say in the book, to move from orientation, which is the general just increasing in awareness and understanding about society, into adaptation, which is adjustment to it and being able to navigate it in a way that moves them further down a trajectory of mobility. It's really interesting what you're actually saying because that's also what uh, goal setting actually research shows is that when you actually share your goals, then you're much more likely to actually follow through because to some extent, like you, you build into it, it uh, to some extent, accountability right and that you were mentioning in a collective right. society that's more you know important than in a more individualistic society and i think also there is something to be said that in general and we see this um, across the board in the western world that if there is a certain saturation of certain wealth of certain uh, education that people more and more they they lose at some point almost like their purpose because and that's and I'm really curious what you think about this I always tell people and that might be controversial I always say people that whether you grow up in a in a billion uh, in in a family that that has like with in a billionaire's family or in a family who is let's say not in poverty, but it's just like, you know, has it tough. I always say that, you know, it's very likely that the kid from the billionaire's family, he might have as much obstacles, but they are just in different kinds, right? So it's basically, well, why should you work or do anything? Because if everything is given already, you know, it loses to some extent in value, right? So that is to me always a thing that, uh, and that's not, I'm not at all making the case in terms of that this is good that you you grow up in a, in, in a impoverished family at all, but I'm just saying in terms of the meaning making of us being human, which also really is also to some extent like sociology, especially anthropology, which really is we as human, we are human, uh, see, meaning seeking and meaning making beings, right? Whatever we do, we look somehow to connect the dots together, you know? So I I want to 
ask you in terms uh, as a sociologist, what are the risks if we live more and more in a society where these metas are not really given anymore? What does, does it do in general to society, but then also the consequences it can potentially have on marginalized people such as undocumented young people who made it to the U.S.? Yeah, I really like your your explanation of the meaning making. I think that's so important. That that's really a central part of the work that that I did in the book as well. Um, because a lot of the young people that I interviewed, all of the young people that I interviewed and I spent time with, the markers of success that we sort of associate with adulthood or mobility. Uh, socioeconomic markers of success in the U.S. or other Western contexts are simply unavailable to them, right? Um, educational attainment, diplomas, degrees, uh, socioeconomic markers like home ownership, wealth accumulation, business owner, like all of these things are just out of reach uh, because their starting point, their sort of entry into U.S. society and also their starting point in the trajectory of childhood are just very different, right? Uh, so they're they're looking at things like the ability to manage their emotion. They learn to manage their emotions on on their own, right? They they were very depressed for several years, or they um were experiencing like rage and all of these things, right? And they learn to manage their emotions. Young people who were originally alone and didn't have friends now can point to a group of friends that they can call on, and that becomes a marker of success. Young people maybe don't have wealth that they can point to, but they were construction workers and they say, you know, I participated or I contributed to building that apartment complex on the intersection of these two streets in Los Angeles. And that becomes a marker of success. Um, and to answer your, your question about, you know, what is lost when those metas are lost, I also explore that in this idea of perdición or perdition, uh, which young people use the term perdición, even young people that didn't know each other, that I interviewed individually, described the U.S. as un lugar de perdición. You, you experience the U.S. as a place of perdition or a place of loss. And the difference between young people who experience adaptation, positive, versus perdition, negative, is the absence of social ties, the absence of meaningful relationships to people that could, um, one, provide them with a place of goal setting, right? The collective goal setting and being able to share what they were working towards. Young people also talked about the importance of being witnessed, someone knowing that they exist in the U.S. and someone acknowledging that they were reaching their goals, right? Uh, there were some young men that talked about, you know, their romantic interests as witnessing them, right? The, I, I, I like that she says, like, I'm proud of you or good job, right? Something like that. Uh, young women didn't oftentimes have access to those romantic relationships where they could be witnessed. Um, I talk a lot in the book about the isolation of women because of gender expectations of being more, you know, moral and pure and sort of um, out of the public sphere. Uh, but also the importance of social ties, meaningful social relationships with which young people could practice this aogo, this unburdening, the, the venting, the release of their worries and stress and emotional, uh, overwhelming emotions that they often described, right? So that becomes really important in allowing young people to continue towards this path of adaptation to a society, which I argue is not um, is not necessarily like achieving. It, it isn't an achievement. It isn't an outcome. It is a process of constant adjustment versus something like perdition, which is a state of loss, right? A state of losing one's goals and losing the sight of one's goals, but also losing the self. Uh, and in these cases, young people experience things like drug and alcohol addiction, 
you know, to soothe the feeling of loss, which we know can then add financial costs to one's life, which then causes more distress, which causes then more perdition and loss. So the cycle of loss um, and also um, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and a few young people lost their lives to suicide during six years of my field work um, because the perdición was too heavy, right? The, the loss was too heavy. And again, not just the loss of one's goals, the material goals, but the loss of oneself emotionally and socially. Yeah, that's really tragic uh, to hear that, um, you know, suicide and um, and it obviously that that affects everyone, including yourself, I imagine. And uh, so uh, but what I also can see is that there is this incredible responsibility that they feel they bear. And to me, again, I come back and um, to, to this value that these young people actually bring to the U.S., just as human beings, just the mat maturity, just the fact that, you know, they push through in so many ways when you face this big of a, an adversity. And just also, as you mentioned, how they define success, right? It's more about contributing, mm -hmm. you know, they want to ultimately help someone else, their families, and ultimately other people who come in. So that is really, really wonderful to see. And to me, when I hear this, it's like if I will be an employer, I would like uh, seeking those kind of people because they really demonstrate incredible qualities that you really want to see and want to seek out in order to build your business and contribute to society. So how does it play out for these young people? And you mentioned also examples in the book. How do they move up ultimately the ladder, if at all, when it comes to their jobs that are available to them or not? Yeah, so um, many of the young people that I interviewed um, were connected to jobs by someone that they already knew in the U.S. Typically, that long-settled relative that wasn't able to take them in um, would say something like, I can't provide you anything else, but I can give you basically a referral to a job, right, so that you can be on your way to supporting yourself. So young people did receive those referrals to jobs. But again, if you're getting a referral to a job from an undocumented immigrant, it, it is the factory work. It's the restaurant dishwasher. It's the car washer, hotel um, maintenance job, right? The, they're not prestigious um, or desirable jobs, which is why undocumented immigrants end up in them to begin with, right? Um, young people very quickly learned that one of the most important vital ways that they could achieve mobility, even within their occupation that was very limited, um, was through English language learning. Um, it was important to be able to set themselves apart from the other immigrants that had already been working there longer, um, but also the newcomers that would accept lower wages than they would, you know? And one of the ways they could do that is through direct communication with the factory owner, direct communication with the restaurant manager, the car wash supervisor. So I talk in the book about how young people um, set new goals, right? New metas related to education. And it is often not, again, the education for the sake of knowing U.S. history or becoming a sort of math whiz or achieving any sort of diploma, um, it is education for the sake of learning enough English to then go back to work and demand that your wages be higher or to defend yourself if you're being bullied, harassed, abused, to um, ask for a more prestigious job, maybe not a dishwasher, but a food prep, right? Maybe not a someone who sews 300 t-shirts in a day, but someone who's asked to make a sample of a, a gown that they could spend a week on one single project, right? Um, and not experience 
extreme exploitation, but maybe moderate exploitation for that one week, right? So I think in this case, we're talking about a group of immigrants, a group of teenagers who think about mobility, not in, yes, there are those long-term goals, right? Yes, there's the goal of, of course, they, they want citizenship, and of course, they want um, to to have careers and college sounds nice, but the everyday goals for mobility that they carry in them and on their minds and on their shoulders, I would even say, is this idea of um, just getting ahead enough, right? So um, that could be a better job in the same industry. It could be moving from the garment industry to restaurant work, which was seen as less exploitative, Um or again, moving from the back of house to front of house in something like um, a, a warehouse job or a restaurant job. Uh, so that's that's how they think about mobility and these steps and often as attached to English language learning or other sort of skill learning to achieve those, those sort of milestones. To deviate a little bit from the book and we come back again after what does this work give to you on a personal level? Oh my gosh, what does it give to me on a personal um one of I, I mentioned really early on in our conversation that I didn't grow up knowing my family's migration story, my parents' migration story. I knew how they met and kind of everything that happened after. Um, but what this book has given me personally is the ability to explore what their lives could have looked like, both of my parents. Um, my mom, you know, in, in the book, I talk about young people who were turned away by their long settled relatives and other young people who were received by long settled relatives that sort of worked together to patchwork. So of the 75, five of them were really lucky and they got to have the sort of more normal childhood or normative childhood. The other 70 were those full-time workers that had to fend for themselves. My dad was in that group of 70. My mom was in the group of five. And to sort of see, sort of reflect back without them having to relive their lives for me, um, how these stories might have shaped the way our family came to be. And even, you know, putting into context now, like how they parent, right? The advice they give, how they view the world. It, it gave me a little bit more of a backdrop for my own family and um, the various things they still carry with them, right? What do you think about the, like, the exploitation, which is just huge? I mean, it's tremendous what these young people go through and how people take advantage of disadvantaged people, you know, which is just, it's, it's depicable. But I want to know from your perspective as a sociologist, you know, if we get rid of really become more and more strict when it comes to those practices, what do you think? Will it do more harm or do good for especially young, undocumented uh, uh, young children, uh, you know, adolescents? Because my question is like that, you know, potentially then they might even have a harder time to actually make a, a living or how do you see that? Yeah, this is a million dollar question, I think. People always want to ask me, and then we never get to it. So I appreciate that you're bringing it up now. Um, here's what I know based on what we see happening at the border and what we've seen happening at the border for decades now. When we impose enforcement and compliance policies, when we do the um, sort of let's make people's lives harder so that they will stop coming or let's make their lives harder so they stop doing the thing that we that they're doing right um it only it, it doesn't actually stop the problem it makes it more dangerous and it makes it more hidden in the shadows and i bring up the border because there's so many mig migration scholars 
um, that have done such important work to show us how building taller walls, longer walls with stronger materials isn't actually slowing migration. What it's doing is increasing the financial cost. So people are spending maybe 35 instead of $15,000 to migrate to the U.S. without um, authorization. And also they arrive with more injuries because they're falling off of these walls, you know. Um, and 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 again, the, the journeys become more hidden. People are going into more dangerous, dangerous regions to cross into the U.S. So I imagine, and there are some news stories that have come out that enforcing more, taking a compliance approach, taking an enforcement approach on child labor without addressing the causes for labor, right? Which we can talk about the displacement. We can talk about the disruption of economies. We can talk about the political repression, but we could also talk about children desire to end the suffering of their family members and their own suffering and to provide care. So I am of the mind that if we take a care-centered approach, if we sort of lift the burden of having to care for their families from children's shoulders and we mind that gap, right? If we provide systems of support and systems of integration, and if we, as the opening of the book suggests, ask youth, what is it that you need to do well and be well, as opposed to punishing them for not being in the places at the times that we want them to be there, would that actually change the trajectory of their lives? I'm all for people that are out of compliance, who are abusing and exploiting children, but not just children, I'm talking about adult, everyday people walking around, farm workers in the Central Valley of California or anywhere, any economy really, exploitation of people is just unacceptable. And we can't, pro we can't prioritize profit over people. That's just not an appropriate way to structure our economy or our society. But especially in the case of children, there's something about kids working that, that yanks at our hearts a little bit differently. So I always think like, sure, punish the perpetrator, but can you care for the child at the same time or with greater emphasis? And might that have a more effective, longer lasting impact, right? And of course, you mentioned all the root causes. And what do you think is the biggest problems in that region of the world? You mentioned there were a lot of uh, interference, of course, by toppling democratic gover governance, uh, for example, right, by the U.S. So what do you think is sociologically speaking so troubling and so difficult to build these democratic uh, institutions in order to help really uh, so the social, the political, but also the economic development of, uh, of this, this region? You know, because it, it seems as, as there is so much problems and it's almost like from a humanitarian perspective, we all, you know, you can't blame anyone who, who wants to, to better their lives, right? The, the U.S., right? And, uh, and, uh, but you also mentioned mm -hmm. in the book, I found this also very interesting that the dream usually uh, becomes uh not really the dream so it's obviously it's also a whole other uh game when you arrive at the u.s but what do you think is important what we have to consider in order to build more sustainable societies whether in the u.s or in um, in central central america yeah I think in, in the U.S. context, I write in the book and I say in every conversation I have, I really urge everyone to think about what I what I said a few moments ago, that sort of care, child-centered approach, right? Um, an an in immigrant integration agenda would be much more efficient in addressing any sort of problem in the U.S. context. 
I, I think, you know, people have been advocating for the legalization of the undocumented immigrants that have been in the U.S. for 10, 15, 20 years for the last decade, right? Um, and, and those were the long-settled immigrant relatives that were receiving newcomer children, newly arrived children. So if we had done that 15 years ago, mites of today's unaccompanied children have arrived in households that were better stabilized, right? That were better positioned to receive recently arrived children and therefore children wouldn't have to work. Um, and I think that intergenerationally is going to be one of the solutions, right? In terms of the origin countries, stabilizing the origin countries, um, one of our longstanding approaches to addressing the so-called root causes of migration um, has been to invest in corporations and to say that there will be a sort of trickle-down economics, that the corporations will provide jobs and that those jobs will provide wages and those wages will stabilize households and people will migrate less. Um, we have seen decade after decade after decade how these corporations are also exploiting people, right? They are um, getting you know, tax incentives and environmental protections are uh, weakened in order for those corporations to exist there. And the elites are benefiting from those corporations being embedded in their economies. And the people that were, you know, supposedly going to stop migrating are now migrating in higher numbers, right? And the environment is degraded and water sources are um, polluted. Land is, their nutrients are being just sucked out of the ground, right? So more and more people are being displaced because of that approach of investing in corporations as opposed to, again, investing in communities. I'm thinking now of, um, I make this argument in the conclusion of, of my book, but I'm thinking also of the work of Lauren Heidbrink. She's an anthropologist and she's done great work in Guatemala um, looking at how the rise of the securitization policy um, and the attempts to control the population uh, has actually destabilized communities even more, right? And I think also in the context of a community investment approach, it isn't the national community. In the book, I talk about how young people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico are being displaced for different reasons at different rates. But even in those nations, a rural region would be differently displacing of a young person than an urban region. So if we are actually to, you know, throw money at a root cause, it should be at uh, investing in community-based organizations that are regionally rooted, that understand the metas of the young people in that place, so they can invest sort of from the ground up it, instead of from the top down, hoping that the economy does eventually trickle, right? Um, but really thinking about the human experience again, which is what I hope the book does over and over, is to remind people that, yes, it is 750,000 unaccompanied children, but it is also just Caleb and Esmeralda and Delia, like individual people that have lived these realities of displacement and migration. Yeah, and you really give some really tangible um, policy ideas that can actually be done investing in, in communities and what I especially liked was also to really invest in entrepreneurship programs right because that's really empowering and it lifts young people up and I think that's a that's a, a, a brilliant idea now what do you think is the challenge that government especially the US government is not very much inclined to actually also invest in those kind of initiatives you know what do you think is the reason why these initiatives haven't been done yet at the bigger scale capitalism <laughs> capitalism i think is my response um to this question we have structured our 
political economies in this way, right? This is generations in the making that we um, have developed economic or yeah, economic integration policies that are meant to meet our political goals and politics that are meant to meet our economic goals. And again, we we prioritize profit over people over and over and over. Um, you can read any book about the history of uh, Latin American migration, and it is the same story as you were saying, history repeating it, right? Uh, because we leverage one institutional body to achieve the other thing, and politics and the economy are sort of work in this way. Um, I'm also reminded that in the case of Central America, the U.S., you know, at the height of the civil wars in Central America in the 70s and 80s and 90s, when the U.S. was sending millions of dollars every day to fund the uh, government repression and military violence there, the U.S. refused to acknowledge that the, the Central American governments were um, harming, persecuting their people uh, because that is anti-democratic, right? And we were actively trying to frame Central America as a communist threat. And because of that, we did not grant uh, refugee status, legal status to the hundreds of thousands of Central Americans that were displaced then. And again, the what happened then sets up the story as it's happening now with Central American children and Mexican children arriving to the U.S. into households that are undocumented, resource poor, and unable to offer support. So when the government expects people to offer support and the people expect the government to meet its needs and no one is actually able to do that thing, you end up with a case of newly arrived children not having anywhere to go and having to fend for themselves. So this isn't something that happened in 2014 at the start of the humanitarian crisis when we first saw and accompanied children all over the headlines. This is something that happened in starting in the 1950s and has been snowballing into the problem that we see today. And I just urge people to think about um, how the adults in the room haven't had the solutions yet, and maybe it's time to listen to children and to listen to youth. And, and the book really attempts to center youth's voices in hopes that we can side with an understanding that young people really do understand their lives. They understand the conditions that have shaped their lives, and they understand what they need for a different future. Last question, what makes you feel alive? I think that changes every day. Um, right now, what is making me feel alive is seeing people activated to um, see a change in the future, see a different world. There's so much chaos and destruction and disaster happening all around us. and um, you know, I am a sociologist first. <laughs> I think a lot about, you know, these repeated cycles, the things that got us into this place to begin with. I'm, I'm overwhelmed a lot of the time with how big the problems feel and are. Um, and what makes me feel alive is people on the ground doing work every single day to make sure the future looks different. A lot like the young people that I interview in the book, right? Sticking to it, making sure tomorrow is different than yesterday and today and that we're moving forward. Dr. Al Canizales, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been such a blessing and keep up your wonderful work. I truly appreciate it, reading your book and I recommend to any listeners to really now grab a copy of Sin Padres Ni Papales, published by University of California Press. Thank you. Dr. Stephanie L. Gonzalez. That's why knowledge matters. Make your life a masterpiece. Visit now programs.d-ykm.com Meant to make you grow.